Hi folks, Chris here of Strata Art Studios. Today's video is just me talking through uh, one of the possible ways to reproduce a hollow form object using lost wax casting. You've designed an object that you know from an aesthetic as well as a material point of view needs to be hollow. It needs to allow for the visual interest of being able to look through the piece at the same time keeping the weight down so that it's comfortable to the wearer as well as the cost of materials. As you can see, as I'm building this piece, that I have already decided to put a central line down the bird skull. This original double frame was built from slightly heavier wire than everything else that I'm using. Uh, it was the profile of the skull itself and by building this way it allows me to build the three-dimensional object in wire and then at the end when I'm about to make a rubber mold uh, it gives me a clean line through the center of the skull to cut so that I can mold both halves. Obviously if I hadn't done this and I had have simply just built the skull as a whole, um, it's next to impossible to actually then try to come up with some sort of mold system to be able to reproduce it. You could certainly have built your object without the two-sided central channel like I'm doing. Um, and you can still have the ability to cut that model in half and still be able to put it back together in a wax form after you have it molded and inject it and so on. But that central channel serves a couple of different purposes. First, when I go to put the model back together, it's sides that will evenly join up and match up. Um, second, uh, it's easier to have those long seam lines when you're trying to join things together instead of a bunch of little spots. And third, being that it's a heavier section, it's going to allow the metal when you cast it a heavier or larger channel to carry metal all the way through the skull when it comes time to casting. I'm also trying to build as much as I can sticking to uh, an exterior plane of the skull. I don't want anything really passing through the center um, because this would cause problems when I split it to make the rubber molds by having wires that are internal that may hold the rubber or um, prevent you from getting a wax out of a mold easily. This is one way that I like to work. It's a free form build um, for lack of a better description where you have an idea and you have it plotted out somewhat in your head or in your sketchbook, but you have to simply build a piece here and there, get it to fit, get it soldered in place, and then move on to the next piece. So what you're watching is the progress as I built the original model for an organic candy skull version of a raven skull. 
some of the clips that you're seeing are just showing the different ways that I manipulate wire to give things more dimension. The original skull was completely built with various gauges of copper wire. I was using a 1.5 millimeter diameter round, 1.3 millimeter diameter round, and 1 millimeter diameter round. I rolled the 1.5 wire through the rolling mill uh, so that it was one mil thick. This gave me a rectangular profiled wire that I used as the central line through the skull. The 1.3 millimeter wire was also put through the rolling mill and taken down to just slightly under a mil thick and the one mil round was left round. I used the different sizes of wire just so that the final piece had a little more um, visual variety for the eye, just to make it a little more interesting to, to look at. Once I had finished filling in the skull completely with the different floral designs and things that I I added and was satisfied with the overall final appearance. I split it in half and added the molding sprues and molded the, the two halves in separate molds. I had to remove the sprues from these two original waxes because the way that they were attached had them slightly out beyond the plane of the central line, uh, the backside of each of the, the bird skull halves. If I had have left them where they were, they would have held the two halves apart, thus making it difficult to make a clean uh, seam line between the two halves. I'm using a small butane torch to heat up my melting tool. I normally use a small old school Bunsen burner as my heat source when I'm working on waxes, uh, but at the moment I'm out of fuel and the butane torch is there so it comes in handy. There are also lots of commercial um, wax melting tools that run electricity and batteries, those work well. But as long as you have a heat source that's hot enough to heat your tool up enough to melt wax, um, use what you have. So I work my way around the skull, and once I have it completely joined together and everything is solid and the wax is all hardened up well, I will then go in with my little carving pick and work at all of the detail points that may have gotten flooded when I was joining the two halves together, uh, as well as cleaning up in amongst all the different patterns and lines, removing any uh, little flashes uh, of wax that would have occurred when it was molded. So once I have all of the detail cut back in and cleaned up, as well as cleaning the skull up of anything that may be out of place or pieces of wax that are stuck because of where I was carving. Um, I'll add a couple of sprues, uh, invest it, and cast it. A little tip for anyone who hasn't done much casting, a good rule of thumb uh, to remember is that if you've rubber molded something, and you can get uh, a good wax uh, model out of that mold, uh, you have a really good chance of it casting properly when it comes time to casting. Uh, that being said, it means that you might have to 
change your temperatures ever so slightly when you're casting. Um, as in, uh, your flask needs to be a little warmer than you would normally have it. Uh, because finer lines will solidify much quicker than thicker, heavier channels. So if you're having trouble getting something that's a uh, finer wire or finer design to, to cast, um, simply try increasing your flask casting temperature by 50 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you, you'll probably find that they'll work just fine. That being said, there are also many variables for something not working, like how you've sprued something, the temperature of your metal, and so on. So here you see the final piece in sterling silver that has been oxidized and then polished. I think it turned out really well. I am very happy with how it cast and, and turned out. I want to say thank you so much for everyone who has watched this. I hope you got something out of it. And that's all for now. Bye. Until the next one.